everyone, thanks for joining me. I was just going to say that this has been a hell of a year. If you're in the, the West Coast or even in the central time zone we've had, uh, or, or in the central uh, states, we've had uh, fires, we've had smoke, we've had all kinds of craziness this year, let alone, you know, the pandemic. So I'm excited to bring everyone together here to talk about maybe things we've learned, but also how we can set forth and do an even better year next year, uh, growing outdoor. We've um, got so many people in the cannabis community that come to us that want to learn to grow. And so if you're one of those people, this is your opportunity to learn from some of the best out there. We're going to talk about growing from seed to harvest, to trim, and to smoke. So um, I'm just going to set up the intro here because I'm going to hand it over to my man, J.R. Token. He is the master of ceremonies today. He's going to lead us through. He's put together this panel. Uh, so huge shout out to J.R. Token. And he's also put together the questions. So um, without further ado, J.R., I'm going to hand it over to you, man. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Q. Uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up. Um, I'll go through some introductions here, and as I say your name, you can just maybe wave so much let let people know who you are. Uh, first of all, we've got Jeff from Dragon Flame Genetics. All right, Jeff, thanks for coming. Uh, we've got Moby Dill, greenhouse grower from High Life Farms, and then we got that? Indica. We got Indica B, cannabis uh, outdoor grower. And we got favorite enemy, Northern Lights, uh, Canada's outdoor grower. What's up, guys? Hey there. Uh, Can you hear me? Yep. JR? This is Odie. Are you in? Hey, Odie's in. And then we got Odie Diesel in the house, right? Inside. Welcome, Good. man. Yeah. Welcome, Odie. Welcome. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start getting to these questions because I want to kind of hammer these out. Uh, like I said, I'll go ahead and I'll let you know, Odie. I'm going to address a question to an individual then i would like to open it up for discussion and uh, you came in right in time because you are the first question and the question is about uh genetic selection for the region that you're in uh, a lot of new growers hear names like oh cookies or birthday cake or whatever and they think oh i'm just going to plant those in my backyard uh, but maybe explain to people a little bit about how region has a, a factor on what you grow outdoors. Yeah, definitely. Region has a huge factor. Um, you know, light levels, um, humidity, um, the time that colds come, time rains come, um, drought. You know, it really depends upon where you're at for sure. Um, and yeah, definitely not all strains are going to work everywhere. Um, so normally what I like to suggest is you know, just find something that works for you. Pop some seeds, do some pheno hunting. Um, it may take more than a pack, you know. Uh, but it's, yeah, I can't stress enough how important it is to look for something that works in your region. Um, we sell seeds all around the world, and uh, I get reports from Canada and Mexico and Australia and all over the place. Um, but, yeah, it definitely uh, plays a big role in where you're at and what you're picking. And now can you, uh, a lot of times, like, there are people who will grow generation after generation in a, in a, uh, in a specific region. Um, th and those are the kind of people that you really want to kind of get hooked up with. So you know, maybe what already has acclimated to the region you're in, and maybe working in that area that you're in. Yeah, most definitely. So it, uh, Having the help of locals is huge for sure, um, and getting getting a hold of something that's been acclimated to that region for generation after generation helps a lot as well, because plants have a memory that goes along with them, and they'll re they remember and react to problems before to make themselves stronger for the next year. Excellent, excellent. All right, um, the next uh, question, I'll go ahead and pop this one over to you, uh, Northern Lights. Um, what are some strategies to getting an early start on the season? Northern Lights is muted. There we go, my bad. Okay, yeah. uh, I think, the most important part to getting an early start is getting 
uh, some prep work done. You know what I mean? Have, have a, have a plan of what, you know, what your, what your season is going to look like and make sure, uh, make sure you can do it, do your transplanting in as few steps as possible. You know, you know, the, I try to, I like to, I like to pop my seeds in like the little jiffy pots with the little net on there. So you could have a real, real easy transplant plant into like a one gallon pot. And then just from that, I go just that one gallon in, into the big bed as few steps as possible, I think is important for an early start. And I think it's important not to stress those plants when they're real small. Cause I think it sets, sets you up, you know, it sets you up poorly for the next, for the next stage. And I think, uh, overwatering young plants is a plague in the cannabis community. And I think that you got to avoid that, you know, uh, whenever you can and real light on the nutrients. Those little plants don't need very much at all. Like they're real, they want to go, man. They got the, you know, they got, they got some stuff with them already when they're seedlings, when they pop, they got some nutrients with them. So, so go easy on the nutrients and let them, they're, they're amazing plants. They'll do amazing things. If you, if you stay out of the way a lot of times. And so now what are some of the soil preps or outdoor preps that you can do to prepare for the season? Um, I think it's important to, to think about your cow mag. You want to think about that stuff early, especially in organics, because you're not really using anything out of a bottle, you know? Uh, I think it's important to, for new plants to have a nice, a, a kind of a buffer around them when you transplant them so you're not going straight into the soil. I think that's, you know, so I think you need to have I always keep some moss on hand because it's good to mix mix your soils down a little bit. Um, I, I don't till, I, so I think it's important to plan your cover crops. So when you go when you go to transplant, you don't have a bunch of real tall plants taller than the than the seedling or the the small plants going in because that's definitely trouble. You want your you want the cannabis plants to be the king of the canopy at that point. So you want to, the cover crop timing is crucial for your transplant. I think that's good advice. Um, anyone else got anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, so for me, whenever I pop seeds too for outdoor, um, I generally am gonna be popping way more than I know I need. That way you can really pick the ones that are raging. Um, you know, it's something that you can't be scared to call the weak. The, the ones that the ones that are that are heads and tall heads above their siblings are going to be the ones that are going to perform the best um you know the the way full term is, is a marathon it's you know you can't make up time once you've lost it so it's better to give your energy to the ones that are the ones that are raging the ones that are screaming i want to go um you know that that makes a huge difference especially when you're talking, you know, over the course of the, of the full term season. Um, could one of you guys talk about like kind of timing? Cause when I was started growing outdoor, I fucked it up last year where I put my plants out too early and they started flowering, you know, in May or something like that. So I was curious how you guys kind of time, um, when you're putting your outdoor outdoor and, and then I guess, uh, kind of related to that, how do you like to grow, um, a few giant plants or are you kind of growing, you know, smaller plants? I was curious what people's strategies were around that. Cause that's going to kind of affect when you're putting these seedlings in the ground. Well, I know, uh, seedlings, you can get out quicker than you can clones. Cause clones, in my experience, at least I've had, I've had more problems with clones, uh, spring flowering than I have seeds, but they seedlings definitely will too. And you kind of got to, I mean, it's area specific. It depends on how much sun you get, you know, cause I got a lot of shade where I'm at. I'm not in full sun. So I got to get out there a little bit later. I don't put, usually I don't like to have anything in the big beds before June. I like to be out there in June cause just, I've had that experience and I, it's a, uh, as, and we're talking about prep work. That's some definite important prep work because it really, that really sets you back and it makes little weird bushy spots on the plant that are a pain to clip out of there. And they're just a, like a bug factory or, you know, or a mold factory. So it's, it's definitely important, but it's kind of, it's kind of, in my, in my opinion, it's spot specific. So you, so it's trial and error, but if you, if you, I've never had, I've never heard of anybody having that problem if they go out like the first of June. So that's, yeah. that's why I go out the first of June. 
Well, that kind of leads into the next question. Uh, maybe, Jeff, you could talk a little bit about the difference between growing in a tropical zone versus yeah. growing in a northern zone. Yeah, definitely. So when we were in Oregon, um, for our full terms, we'd usually start our seeds and start pulling clones, usually in January or February. Um, and then we had a small hoopy, you know, just a simple PVC, you know, five foot tall with 20 foot bows that we would run supplemental lights that uh, we'd match June 1st, that the lights would come on as if the sun was rising and setting on June 1st. So you'd pull those same times from your climate and then you can get a super jump start. The way we've always had to grow is with plant counts. So for me, we've always been about maximizing what your plant count can do. And so for full term, you know, usually we're talking, you know, hundreds or two hundreds minimum uh, gallon pots, usually big beds, um, you know, four by four beds. So it's, you know, we're shooting to have the, the full plant potential of size um, out in our gardens. So, you know, we try to get that, that super early start. Um, generally, we try to be planted uh, for the monsters by Mother's Day um, in their final in their final pots. And that's, you know, some some climates, you can't do that. It's a little too soon for, for frosts. You know, it's really climate dependent. But now coming over here to Hawaii, it's um, here, it's always flower time. We're equatorial here. Um, so instead of like doing a depth crop, like a lot of people do, we're having to do the opposite where we're having to run supplemental lights to keep things in veg and from not flowering the second they go out and having tiny little plants. Um, I mean, and the biggest, the biggest change here from Oregon to Hawaii is definitely the humidity, um, here every single night, it's 99% humidity. During the day, it's generally over 65. You know, if, if, it, if we've had rain that day, it's going to be closer to 85. So fungal issues um, are huge here. You, can, you, cannot, you cannot be lazy and succeed. You really have to hit them with a full IPM regimen. Um, you know, and then the other big thing is on the West Coast, you know, where we were at, we'd have snow during the winter. And snow is a huge um, resetter of pests and um, really will knock down a lot of a lot of things. And since we don't have that here in Hawaii, there's no, there's absolutely no off time. The bugs, they're growing year round. The plants are growing year round. So it's simultaneously the easiest place because nothing wants to die. But on the other hand, it's one of the hardest uh, places that I've ever had to grow just because it makes you earn it. You have, absolutely have to be on it. Um, you know, we're rotating as many different organic sprays as we can through just so that nothing is able to build a resistance to any single one thing. Um, like right now we're doing the Korean natural farming. So we're doing the FAAs um, and the OHN um, and lab, you know, for the, to the KNF side. And then right now we're also using uh, suffix oil and Grandivo for part of our, our IPM program. And then we also are using Serenade as well. You know, these are all organic listed products. Um, and I'm, I'm talking in veg. I don't, I'm not someone that believes in spraying flowers. You know, I, I think your IPM has to be on point in veg to get them through flower. If you go into flower with pests, you're gonna have a bad run. That's just, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, so it really comes down to staying on your game. Um, putting them to work, making sure that, you know, everything is staying on point um, and getting yourself. And a lot of it too is as the grower, you know, there's days that you don't want to be out, but you gotta, you gotta put the sprays in, you gotta put the time in. Um, you know, it's definitely, you gotta earn it to get the, to get the, you know, the best possible, the highest quality, you know, that maximum of what the plant can do. Yeah, I, uh, I've noticed since this COVID thing and the quarantine thing and being home all the time, my garden looks a lot better than it did in the past just because I have so much <laughs> more time, you know, and it just goes to show you how much, you know, your garden really needs you there. Um, you know, some things are set to kind of autopilot, but still at the same time, if you're there giving them daily love, it, it shows, it really does show. Yeah. All right, so...
I'll move on to uh, Northern Lights, uh, favorite enemy. Uh, what are some veg techniques uh, one can do to kind of maximize their yields for uh, outdoor greenhouse? Uh, for outdoors, especially organics, um, setting up your yield in veg is really important not to do too, to get too much nitrogen in your soils. Like, it's like in a no-till situation, you can get too much nitrogen and it doesn't really show as a nitrogen over shock, you know what I mean? It, they just kind of, they veg up real fast and then they just kind of get stuck in the mud and then when they get to flowering and your yield will really suffer. So if, you know, be careful with how much alfalfa is really good to use in no-till for, for, uh, for quick growth, but you want to be real careful how much you use because I've in my beds, I overdid it one year and it took quite a while for it to work itself out. So you, you, you I, when, in veg, I like to see a plant like, accelerate into flowering like you know through july they should just like ex almost explode that's when you want to see like the the most big you know the most vigorous growth you know you want to you want to see a big change from july 1st until they start flowering you know what i mean they, they want to i want to see them i want to see them accelerate i don't want to see them start to slow down you know uh it's uh, like like uh, he was saying before, if you get if you go into into flowering with pests, it's it really sets you up poorly, you know. And if you go in with uh, too without with too much nitrogen, it really sets you up poorly too. And it's not that tough to do in organics. Um, I think it's important to the IPM, like he was saying, is real important too because, as you, as I was saying, the bugs really the bug once it, once you're in flowering, you limit you limit your options uh, severely. So. Uh, and it's just important outdoors is every day is you can't get it back is every day is precious. You know, if indoors you get, if you have a little problem, you can go a little extra veg time and try to get them back into full vigor. But you know, outdoors is every day is that day's gone. You know, you can't get it back. So, so treat every day like that. And like you're, uh, like you're saying, your shadow is your, is your, is your, is the best fertilizer, you know, uh, keep, keep an eye on them every day and, and know your plants you know if you know your plants and you know what they're doing uh by the time they get into flower you you're gonna know them good enough you're gonna have all their quirks worked out you know each you know each plant's a little bit different so try to figure out those differences because once you get i mean that's where you really hit the sweet spot with them you know and if you if you know your plants when you hit flower you're probably going to yield more just because you know a little bit about them you know is that you, you got that you might, that makes sense yeah and now some people talk about starting, I mean, as I think uh, Jeff, you mentioned, someone talks about starting uh, maybe indoors pre-season uh, or in a hoop house. Uh, can, Odie, can you kind of speak on that? As far as starting earlier? Or yeah, getting an early start. <laughs> yeah, light depth's where it's at if you want to get an early start. That is running auto flowers. Um, auto flowers is kind of nice. We did a cycle inside underneath of our full term crop this year and uh, did quite well with that. Um, but yeah, to, that or, or genetics, you know, you can find genetics. We have our Oregon diesel, which is a semi-auto flower strain. Uh, no matter what the light is outside, it's going into flower right when you put it out. Um, there's different, there's a lot of different genetics that do that. Not just that one, but several. Um, other than that, you yeah, have light depths where it's at, get your veggies, Get them vegged up to a good size and let them go with the light depth. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So now we're going to move on a little bit to talk about some of the uh, pest control issues we were talking about. Um, Moby Dill, you're in a greenhouse situation. Can you Lucy, talk about, can you talk about uh, some of the uh, options for um, greenhouse um yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. So again, it's, you know, coming from a commercial thing, you, you, you got to go by, you know, your state rules and uh, make sure you're going to pass testing, things like that. But, uh, you know, a lot of things that we use are, you know, like mammoth can of control is really good in veg, uh, you know, it's corn oil, pine oil, um, a new product power size got coming out called control. Uh, it's like peppermint, a um, whole bunch of other stuff in it, what we got. Water, castor oil, soap, vitamin E, and clove and peppermint oil based in it. So uh, stuff like that's really good. Uh, Azamax is another favorite product of mine. It's also systemic. 
So uh, one thing I like to do, especially, uh, you know, like Jeff was saying, I don't necessarily like to spray in flour, but I don't believe that you can get all the way through flour without, you know, especially in an outdoor situation, running into some sort of scenario. So as a preventative situation, what I like to do is I'll uh, root drench those kind of products, like a product like the Azamax is systemic. So it'll be uptaken through the roots and kind of translocate throughout the plant uh, to be able to help uh, maintain an IPM. I understand, you know, some guys on no-till situations, whatever, not, not into that kind of thing. That's uh, everyone's got their own style, you know, but uh, in a commercial situation, those are kind of the most useful or in a greenhouse situation that I found and maintain quality, uh, still hitting high numbers, 30% plus, you know, uh, THC and everything in greenhouse. So uh, Serenade's another great product. Xerotol works really well. Uh, those are kind of for molds, mildews. Another thing that we implemented is um, a product from, uh, in, I believe it's innovations for MMJ on Instagram, but uh, what they are is it, they're called ProGuard units, but they take, uh, they take air and water and they convert it into H2O2. So it's not necessarily mm -hmm. the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It smells like rain. The, uh, help me here. It's not like the ionized water. Ionized yeah. So, so it, uh, it, it essentially, you know, kind of helps with any molds, mildews, so things like botrytis. So if you are in a greenhouse, you know, that's a good scenario. It's kind of like a nice backup. We also like to run a lot of predatory mites too, you know, uh, things like Andersonis or pirate bugs or uh, persimilis, stuff like that, you know, uh, they can be super beneficial. And even if you find a, a problem area, what I'll do is, uh, you know, you could get a bottle of 40,000 just fucking overwhelm the situation you know what i mean kind of quarantine it as much as possible and just overwhelm the fuck out of it so those are some of the tips that i like to implement you know for uh greenhouse and outdoor situations thanks i think uh i think a lot of people were really feeling the pest pressure this year um a lot of caterpillars a lot of larva a lot of stuff coming in and just chewing the shit out of everything yeah uh, can you go ahead it uh, it's the year of the worm. They're all over. They're all over social media. They're all. I had a ton of. I had not a, not big problems, but I definitely had problems this year with yeah. the with with the with the caterpillars. Yeah, could I would love to hear because I personally got my ass kicked by caterpillars. So I would love if we can, Jr. to kind of dive into that because I know um, we've been saying, um, you know, we we would prefer not to spray in in flower, um, but. You know those the moths came and the caterpillars uh, came after them. Uh, you know in September, oct uh, clear th here now through you know mid October. I'm still finding or you know seeing those caterpillars around. Curious, what do you got? What does our panel do in that sort of situation? If you if you have to kind of uh, face these bugs late in the, in flower or mid flower. Well, my caterpillars all came. <clears throat> like just right at the end i started seeing the damage so i i just picked them off and you know you and i always go a cup like a set under it too you know what i mean to try to get because they you can see the little turds all over the place and so it's just like well it's just not it's not worth the risk at that point so i i got it so late in flower that most the worst of it happened after about half of my plants were down so i don't know i might have some surprises waiting for me but i just picked it off because at that point there's that's about all i could i could do uh, th there are, it's, I think it's called it, uh, BT. It's like, I think it's called Monterey spray or yeah. something like that. And I think it's cool. It's fun. It used to be at least, I don't know, as far as I know, it's, it's, uh, it's cool for organic uh, cultivation because it's just a bacteria, like, like the mosquito dunks, you know what I mean? It's a, so it's not a, it's not a chemical, it's a bacteria. So it's, it's cool and organic. So I think you could spray with that stuff up until, you know, as long as you're comfortable, I think, which Monterey I'm going to start Garden. doing. The Monterey Gardens product is a spinosad product. Um, it works fantastically. Um, unfortunately, in legal states, we can't use it, even though it is just a bacteria that destroys them. Um, we are starting to see benefits from PFR at high doses, um, because which is weird because normally you use it in the soil. But um, outdoors, you got pretty high humidity, so it, it's working and destroying um, small caterpillars and eggs. What what product is that? I'm, I didn't I admit, didn't catch it. PFR. PFR. Yeah, what you use for uh, root root aphids. Oh, okay. 
So is that uh, that similar to uh, like Botanigar? No, Botanigar is more of an oil type base. Um, this is a PFR. It's 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 um, just a bacteria more or less that uh, spreads and forms and molds and covers them and kills them. Right. Well, that's uh, the product I'm speaking of is a bacteria as well. It's like a wettable powder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the guard is a different bacteria. A BT is great, but you got to use it during stretch. Um, and I just want to say really quick, uh, Spinosad, the reason it's it's not recommended, it is the number one organic bee killer. Uh, the bee can visit for like 10 days after you spray Spinosad outdoor and they take it back to the colony and it kills the whole hive. So that's why Spinosad, it is organic, but it is, it is very harmful to bees. So that's, I wouldn't recommend yeah. that in the first period. Um, but yeah, BT during stretch, if you hit, um, if you hit your outdoor plants, you know, July and August with the BT once a week, um, you know, you'll go into flower at least the, the worst of the, the caterpillars is when they're inside the buds. Once, you know, if you catch them when they're at the end of the season, usually they're going to be on the outside of the buds and you can pick them off or, um, you know, a, a, the old school moth bug lights, you know, putting one of those, you know, don't put it right next to your outdoor because you're going to be attracting. But if you put it, you know, 100 feet, 100 yards away from your greenhouse, it's most of the cabbage moths that do the bud worms. And they're very attracted to those those old school bug lights. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's part of, I would say, caterpillars, especially if you use the BT and a bug light, you're going to have very minimal damage. And I mean, when you're doing a big outdoor mother nature takes a cut i mean every year you're gonna have you know that's just part of the game you're gonna lose a little here a little there you know that's you just got to be on it cut it out as soon as you see it when you see the little leaf go limp on your bud that's the giveaway open that bud up because you've got mold on it and if you let it spread it's going to take you know it's going to take a lot more than if you just cut it out really delicately i think that's a good point is identifying uh the problem um like you said you'll see maybe like a yellowed out little little limp leaf and you pull it and it's slimy on the end that lets you know that the worm's in there it's shit in there and the rot is starting to happen and like you said if you surgically go in and cut that out a lot of times you can still manage to your colas might be chunked up but at least they'll still be colas you know won't be all in the trash Right on. Well, that was a good one, guys. Good, because that was really big for a lot of people this year. Uh, like you said, people are just getting their asses handed to them over the pest control. So that was a really good one. Excellent. Um, and I think we kind of talked about the powdery mildew thing a little bit in there, but I would really like to talk a little bit more about powdery mildew. Um, I direct. Uh, I can direct this one to uh, you, Odie, because uh, you are from the uh, Oren area. Uh, so you know about uh, powdery mildew very well. So can you kind of speak about powdery mildew, what you can do to prevent it, and uh, how it, how you can uh, best uh, manage it if you do have it? You know, so the hardest part about PM is it comes in when temperatures start to change and, high, and humidity goes up. Um, the best thing you can do is to remove your big water leaves and then allow airflow. Um, with outdoor grows, it's hard to control the temperature. Um, greenhouses, it's a little bit easier depending upon what your heating scenario is. Um, but yeah, PM is, it's a nightmare. It's everywhere. It's hard to get rid of, hard to get to stay away from. You can, you know, build your plants up with, you know, extra aminos and silicas to help fight against it. Um, but once you have it, <clears throat> the best thing to do is carefully go once, because normally you're worried about it when it's in flower. Um, is go in and spray your leaves with water to make sure that it can't spread anymore and then cut the leaves out. Being, being careful not to get water on the flowers because you get a bunch of water on your flowers, now you got botrytis. So it's a fine touchy thing. Uh, in greenhouse, we deal with it quite a bit. Um, and that's normally what we have. We have our IPM management crews go through and remove infested leaves. Um, but yeah, it's really tough to control outside. And can, mainly, a, can a cut that's given to you, uh, can that cut be a, 
infected with powdery mildew or is it something that happens in your environment only? It could be infected with powdery mildew, but yeah, the environment has to be right for it to, to rear its head. Absolutely. Here's my, so, here's my feeling on powdery mildew and, and please anyone chime in on it because I feel like it's something like MRSA, like it's like a bacteria that's always around and it only takes hold when the conditions are right. Like it's constantly there, but it just can't take hold until the conditions are right. What, how do you exactly. get it? I agree exactly. 100%, 100% I agree. Yeah, I agree. it's all about environment for sure. Um, yeah, it won't it, set in if the environment is there, whether or not the plant came infected or not. Um, if your well, environment's proper, it will kill itself off. 100 so, you know, and there's that old thing, you know, how, how it used to be systemic or it can be passed through seeds. Like, my thing is, is I've seen the same plant get it, and then you can bring it back and put it in a proper setup, and it doesn't get it at all. Exactly. So it's thing to me. Well, I know it's like, go ahead. Uh, it's like in the, like he was talking about the temperature swings and the humidity really bring it on in the fall. And so it's important to back your water off a little bit because you're not, you know, you're not, you, you're not going through as much. So uh, overwatering does, doesn't help the situation. Another thing too with PM is a lot of it is genetics. I mean, you can run, especially if you're running breeders work that is grown, that is breeding in an environment that gets it. I mean, you'll be able to find, if you run enough seed, you'll find plants that are immune. They're definitely out there. I mean, I'm, I know I've oh. seen it many times where, you can have a plant fully infested, fully touching another plant. They absolutely will not get it. And I think, especially if you're in a tough climate, those are the plants that you want to find and keep around and breed with. You know, even if it's just small micro breeding for yourself, you know, having that in the genetics is, is absolutely huge. And some, you know, and unfortunately, a lot of them, you know, the modern hype strains, you know, the cushions and the cookies and the cakes, a lot of the modern stuff that was bred for indoor grows is some of the most susceptible to it outdoors, you know, so that's, that's a big part of it, but there are definitely strains that you can find that, you know, you don't even have to worry about, they won't get it. I, uh, to, to add to your point, Jeff, I, I've seen exactly what you're talking about, and I feel like bubbas, like a, a, any kind of bubbas are really, really uh, resilient when it comes to molds, at least in my growing experience. Yeah, there's definitely uh, weaker celled plants that are more susceptible to it for sure. Um, that's why we suggest when we go into a, a facility to do pheno hunts to find what works best at that facility. Yeah, I noticed like for my one of the varieties that I was running, um, as it was two and three years down the road of cloning it, and it started to you know over time get weaker and weaker. Um, probably because of my lack of experience, but um, as it got weaker and weaker, I noticed like uh, the run prior to me not running it anymore, uh, it was so weak, it got powdery mildew and it had never gotten powdery mildew in the prior two and a half, three years. So in my mind, I'm thinking that plant's immune system is not what it should be. And it's not making the right immune response to fight the powdery mildew in order to keep it away. I would say there's several things to look at there. You'd want to look at your weather for that year as well. And maybe you change something in your room. Um, once again, environment's the biggest killer. Excellent. Good information, guys. Excellent. Um, okay, so now let's kind of switch gears. Uh, we've got through uh, kind of our flowering stage. And we're now uh, looking at some harvesting strategies harvesting a garden that's bigger than your drying space. And it could be, can you kind of speak on that? Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, so for me, uh, it was in 2018, I believe I ran into that situation. And uh, I, oh, it was a, it was a good year that year. I want to say I went 12 that's legal limit where I'm from and uh I did pretty well. And I was like, where, what am I going to do with all this? <laughs> um you know it was I'm, I'm i've got three years now growing uh outside so i'm you know i don't have a lot of experience outside out here yet you know where i'm living and stuff um so anyways i was just unprepared you know as any that was my first 
year, you know, going out here and uh, I was just very unprepared, you know, and uh, too, I think a lot of, I read a lot of stuff too that just uh, set me down some other rabbit holes and stuff, you know, and uh, not in the right places, I guess. And, uh, but anyway, so uh, I ended up uh, going with cardboard boxes and I actually took car, I forget what sizes they were. I had a closet. I knew I could keep that closet, the perfect, um, the room in that closet, uh, the perfect RH and the perfect temperature that I wanted it at. And I could have, you know, I could keep it dark and et cetera. And uh, I actually just took cardboard boxes. I stringed them and I packed as much as I could and I poked holes in the bottom of the boxes. And, um, and then I, I just shut them, not, not fully shut, but just so enough airflow. And I had the fans going on the bottom and the top. And uh, I actually got a 10 day dry time out of that. I was actually very, very impressed. Um, and uh, I actually uh, just used that again too, because uh, me and my wife, we just bought a house. So we had, we move in and stuff. I'm uh, actually building a uh, room out downstairs too, to start up an indoor as well here. So um, I'm pretty busy, but uh, I was like in a crunch, you know what I mean? Just moved in this house and I wasn't really set up, but I, I had to harvest because where I was living, I was growing in a tent. So I had, you know, and I actually used that same cardboard box trick, man. And it, I mean, it prevailed for me. It came out, I mean, it came out beautifully that bud, you know? So for me, that's, you know, if you have uh, an area, say you were playing in, hey, this closet and you just, it blew up like it did for me. Um, if you can, cardboard boxes are cheap, man, you know? I, I bought a bunch of them, I think at like Walmart or something around here and then that's, that taped the bottoms and that's what I did, you know? And it worked awesome for me. Excellent. And so now some people have uh, harvesting strategies and uh, how they take the plants. Um, maybe uh, you could speak on that a little bit. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely, man. So uh, for me, it's um, I, 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 I don't use trim machines, anything like that. Everything gets hand trimmed uh, from the last few years here of growing now. And um, you know, it's, I hate it. It's trim jail, but uh, for me, I love, I love good looking flower, man, you know? So when I harvest a plant, I make sure I'm fully prepared. Um, I make sure whatever I'm using is, you know, fully clean, fully sterilized. Um, and I'll make sure I'm prepared a few days in ahead. Like example, I'm going to harvest tomorrow, actually my outdoor garden. So I'm fully prepared um, by where where my garden is. It's it's at a family's uh, family's property and stuff. And I already have my room, everything all dialed in over there and ready to rock for those plants to get chopped and go. So what I like to do is uh, I get a tote, little, nice little tote, and I bring them outside with me. And um, I I like to just I top off all the big fan leaves, really nice. And I like to just set them in those totes very quickly, but take your time in a way. I like to do, cut off each branch individually. And uh, yeah, and then just uh, put them in all those totes and I get them hung up as uh, fast as possible, you know. Um, but um, I, I, I try to prepare, you know. Um, and I just, I like to, I like to really take my time when I'm harvesting in a way too, as I'm cutting the branches off with, you know, just looking, looking, cause like you, you all just talk outdoors, um, we, we've, battle and fight so many different things and um you know you think everything's going great and this happened to me in 2018 um like yeah you know big big i mean like big chunky colas man and and guess what it was all bud rot man because the caterpillar crawled in there and it took a shit and and you know and i couldn't see it you know i thought oh you know it's that's not bad but as you open that butt up man it's just it's just all brown it's just done you know and then you see all the little shit balls and um you know so you just it's just i, I don't know you know it's it's you battle all those things man so i like to try to be quick but also take your time and go individually every branch and kind of just look and gaze over everything kind of look at it you know and make sure everything's all right so you you're not going to throw that in your dry area and be and, and have mold spores spraying around if you're running fans or or mold or anything spread on maybe that good flower that you had you know from the other plants or something like that you know so you know i guess you know just just you know it's not a rush it's not a race you know what i mean so just you know take your time and 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 learn you know I, you know that's how i feel like i learn and, and and i get better every year you know i'm already can't wait for next year you know what i mean i can't wait and 
I was, uh, you know, not to get off subject, but I'm just blessed to be picked to be able to be on here with you guys, man, and learn a lot. I'm going to put up a greenhouse actually next year, um, you know, 14, uh, 24 feet long by 14 feet wide by 10 feet, seven inches tall, um, cold frame uh, greenhouse. So it was cool to just get a lot of information, man, and, and learn, you know, it will be my first time ever in a greenhouse. Right now, everything's outdoor. Everybody's seen from my videos. Um, that's how I've had it every year. You know, uh, this year was last minute thing. So it's a little bit smaller this year, but, uh, you know, and I had a lot of health problems too, as well, um, unfortunately, but, you know, but so yeah, you know, that's about it, man, dude. Thank, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Now, can someone talk about a little bit about harvesting and taking your uh, ripe fruit and leaving your unripe fruit to finish? Uh, are those uh, strategies that you would recommend or not? Uh, yeah, for me, I, I, I've never done it inside. Uh, I mean, I've never done it outside. Sorry. Um, um, I, I've thought about trying it before. You know what I mean? I'm not really sure. What scared me the most being outside is just where I'm from. I'm in New, Eng I'm in New England. So, uh, I mean, it, it's it's like I, I'm surprised I got this far all the way tomorrow to be able to harvest. You know what I mean? Um it, it's finicky and then next week we're supposed to get snow you know it's it's but usually we could already have snow by now out there you know so um you, uh i don't know uh for me yeah what was the question I'm, I'm i'm pretty high man what was the question again? <laughs> i was trying to answer it <laughs> I was with That's... you, man. I was with you the whole way. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. What, what, what were, you, what was the question though? Again, so I it was about the harvesting, right? Harvesting, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. So, anyways, I've never done it outside just because of all like the what ifs could because like for me, uh, you know, tomorrow it, it could be snowing out when it says it's going to be sunny. You know what I mean? So, uh, but I've done it inside, man. Um, I did it in the run, the first run that I did here in the, in this house that we bought. And uh, uh, before I broke down the rooms and now I opened it all up and I actually, I did it, man. And, and, and it, it worked, it, it worked for me. I had definitely noticed a huge difference. Um, you know, the just, it got, the nugs got definitely a lot, not, a lot fatter, you know what I mean? Um, the potency I'd say wasn't all the way there. Maybe I could have let them go longer. You know what I mean? I'm not really sure, but um, you know, I, 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 I would recommend it indoors. Uh, me, I'm going to say no outdoors just because of my regions, you know, so How about, yeah, um, take, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll take a stab at that too. So, um, on outdoor, I generally do. <clears throat> so my strategy is, is during veg and during transition, um, we put in an inner cage and then we put in an outer cage. And so when we go to harvest, our first harvest is usually everything that's spilling out through the outer cage. You know, those are usually what we would call the top buds. Um, and so those usually, you know, those are the ones that are going to be the most susceptible to mold. If you get a, a little bit of rain, um, you know, if we're, if we're looking at three or four or five days of rain and they're pretty close, you know, that's usually what we're looking for. Um, you know, unless that's one of my strains that I ran enough to know what it can take, you know, then that's case by case, but you know, that's, that can definitely make the difference between, you know, a 50 pound to a hundred pound year, you know, going from, getting your getting your tops letting the the next layer fatten and ripen and then pulling those and if you got if you like really got your maximum plant size you know sometimes you can even do a third chop if weather allows you um and then the other thing too is it also saves you your drying space um you know a lot of times trying to pull your whole the whole outdoor all at once you know that that can take a lot more space than being able to do okay, well, we're going to go get all the biggest tops today, two weeks, you know, if weather allows, we'll go back, get the next layer that has, you know, fattened up, you know, and that can make, that can make a huge difference in your, in your final yields, you know, and the, the lower stuff is, it's not quite the same quality usually on most strains. Some strains, your second pull might even be better, you know, if they were able to get riper, you know, it's really strain dependent, but there's definitely, um, there's, it's definitely worth it. The other thing too, I like to do with that, uh, the, like the lowers and everything is that, that second stage is I'll just uh, collect it all at once and just freeze it and then just end up washing it and pressing it, you know? And then you end up with a nice, really, really nice head stash of some good rosin or good bubble, you know, however you want to keep it. But that's kind of what, what we prefer to do with it out here. 
Well, while we're on that with you, um, uh, Moby, can you talk a little bit about uh, some long-term storage options? What are storage options that will help uh, keep things yeah, as fresh yeah. and as turpy as long as you can? You know, uh, Jay Plant Speaker has been sharing a good tech lately that uh, the bin tech, you know, and, and, and what he does is a whole plant hang and then he'll, instead of just trimming it up, he'll put it in bins and kind of slowly work through it, right? So you don't feel so overwhelmed. Now, obviously, you want to try to put that in an area where it's going to be, you can maintain humidity. So if you could get a little tent, build yourself a little room or something and get a humidifier, really, that's the most important thing. I mean, temperature is important as well. The cooler, the better. Uh, usually around 60 to 70 degrees, but humidity is your biggest factor. So if you can keep it around 55 to 60, I mean, you can let those sit in bins the entire time and you just smoke off of them, you know, but, uh, you know, it, it, essentially it's your preference and what you can work with. But, uh, you know, we usually, usually dark stuff, uh, dark bins and, uh, you know, cool temperatures and good humidity and, uh, that's pretty much a recipe for success. So they go in the bins after they've been hung dried for whatever? For, for, yeah, 14 days, yes sir. Yeah, I mean, ideally once you can start to kind of snap them and you feel comfortable to, to put them in an environment, you can just burp them from there, you know? Excellent, excellent. Worth yeah, could, we'll go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. I, I was gonna say it's worth noting too that when you do the, when you do the bins, it's, Really, it's the best if you can find the ones that have a seal, like the air seal. Um, yeah. That way you're actually starting here and you're not letting the environment and it's super dry out. As long as they got a seal, the bins are great. Yeah, I see a lot of guys use the uh, five gallon buckets that are sealable uh, for storage as well. And now, so I wanna talk about maybe a little bit about the longevity of your storage techniques where like with a, a lot of people like to go into jars um, but in my opinion after about three months it starts to fall off in the jar uh, other people will do like a uh, a pack and seal like a like a vacuum seal situation if they want to store it even longer can people speak about that Yeah, I mean, for us, long-term storage, we, we back seal everything, you know, um, so that's usually the best way uh, to be able to maintain it, back seal it and put it in a dark environment. And, you know, we maintain cool temperatures, uh, put it in a 65 degree room, 60% humidity. The whole point uh, of long-term storage is slow down degradation. Do not crease any kind of light humidity, right? So if we can slow that process down, it, it, we're going to be able to maintain that quality a lot longer. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so now we're on to uh, once we harvest and we've come out of the ground, this is for mostly your outdoor growers. Um, I'll, so I'll direct this one to you, Odie. Um, what can you do to start prepping for the next year as far as uh, <clears throat> As far as you're done with your harvest, what are your plans to get started for the next year? Well, you know, a lot of it has to come down with your techniques. Obviously, if you have cover crops, you don't necessarily want to cover them with the black tarp. Um, but a lot of holes and bags and stuff like that, I like to cover with the black tarp. Um, you can start re-inoculating fairly soon with different things to get good life. But you know, normally just covering them with tarp and waiting until February, March, and then really start prepping them because you don't want to break down all your foods and everything too soon. Um, but is there a too soon? Um, you know, just uh, reworking your soil, getting all the roots back out of it, cleaning it up a little bit, maybe running it through a screen to get any big chunks of roots or anything like that out of it. Um, black tarps work great because it's going to heat it and kill anything within the soil any bugs or anything like that so that helps quite a bit but you know it just there, there once again it's multiple phases of, pre of preparation it's not more of one thing at a time it's or one a whole bunch at once it's one more of a one thing at a time great 
Um, so for people who are in a greenhouse, uh, Moby Deal, when you're doing uh, resets, uh, are you in a living soil? Are you doing cocoa or how are you, how are you approaching your greenhouse? You know, I, I come from the indoor world. So naturally I tried to bring that a, a little bit of that element to the greenhouse. So we kind of, we, we do the rolling benches. We're in uh, charcoal six inch cubes. I tried, I tried five gallons. I tried three gallons and, and, at the end of the day, we only veg for a month. So really to utilize that space, the six inch charcoal cubes were the best and we're not seeing a, a, any difference in yield. It's actually gone up if anything. So um, we use little cubes and what we do is after harvest, we'll pull all that out. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough, it's 17,000 square foot greenhouse that we're operating. So, you know, these are million dollar harvests at a time. So, you know, we have a harvest team of about 10 to 15 people come in there. We'll chop it all down in a day. Next day, we'll get all the pots moved out. And then we're scrubbing tables, cleaning everything. And we'll like either do like a, a, a nice zero tall to kind of reset and, and clean the room. And not to mention, we've got the pro guards that are sanitizing everything the entire time as well. So it, it, it is, uh, that's how we like to do it in a large scale situation. I would say uh, if you're looking for a more organic option for cleaning, I mean, zero tall is Omri listed. The smell will scare the fuck out of people, but uh, it is organic and it's a great product, but EM5 is another great cleaning product if you're uh, one of the organic side of things and uh, you're able to, you know, clean trays, bins, anything you need, you know, pots, whatever you want. So uh, that's another, you can spray it on plants too. And now your greenhouses run year round. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yeah, it's, it's light depth greenhouse, you know, and it's, it's, uh, we have supplemental lighting. So, you know, we in a 17 or excuse me, it's 17,000 square foot divided into three bays. So they're about 6,000 square foot a piece, uh, roughly it's got wet walls. And uh, so we have about 196 lights per bay in there, uh, double ended, you know, and it's all run on a Damatex system. So I'm able to set things so I can set what you know, my watts per meter squared. So if I'm getting 500, uh, 500 watts per meter squared uh, of sun, then, you know, I can have some supplemental lights kick off. That way I don't stress my plants too much uh, uh, with light. You know, we're really able to dial in the technique. You know, we, we have state-of-the-art uh, dry our units that are cool 12 gallons an hour. Um, you know, again, we have cooling pads, wet walls. So whenever it gets a little warm, the, the gable end fans will kick on and it'll pull that air and the wet wall kind of cools the air down. So we have chillers attached to that to be, make sure that the water stays around 60 degrees. Um, so yeah. The word, That's the word. crazy. That's great. And, yeah. so, and so now go ahead and if you guys could talk a little bit about uh, lighting strategies for a greenhouse uh, and, and, and for the newer people, explain why you need uh, supplemental lighting in the winter months and you need uh, light depth in the summer months. Can you speak on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, as the year goes, I mean, winter months, you get less, less light. It, it gets down to almost, you know, thing where you live around eight hours of sunlight in a day. So your plants will start flowering again. So you need to, if you, if you want to continue to veg them, uh, you need to provide supplemental light. Um, that's kind of the biggest reason for supplemental, not to mention if you're trying to flower uh, year round as well, uh, you know, and you want to maintain a certain level of production, you know, like I said, we have a, a, a 20 man team running that greenhouse. So people have paychecks reliance. So, you know, we're expected to hit a certain quota every harvest, right? So we, we try to maintain redundancy is the safest way to grow. So if you can have as many options to guarantee your success, that's the best way to do it. Uh, the, the more you invest into it, the more secure you have your, uh, your grow, you know? So again, you get out what you put into it. Excellent. Uh, Odie, can you kind of speak a little bit on, um, on, on greenhouse production and uh, what, it, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of things you need to do to kind of be successful in that arena? Yeah, you know, um, it really depends on the size of your greenhouse. Um, I just recently started another job. Uh, we have four houses, each one is an acre. So right about 40,000 square feet of canopy per acre. 
we flower an entire acre at a time, which makes a lot of, a lot of work, you know? Um, so yeah, supplemental lighting is a must, especially during the winter time. Your spectrums and your flow, your, your light is just completely different um, at that point. And if you don't have any kind of supplemental, your, your weights are gonna be nil. Once, once, you know, we're, we're flowering um, 12,600 plants at a time. And uh, we're running a lot of lights, <laughs> um, dual ends. And we also have some LEDs that we're running as well. So here in California, they're getting ready to pass laws that we have to use LEDs only. So that's going to be a challenge. So we're all starting to play with that at this point, trying to figure out what's going to work the best wherever. There's so many different LED companies out there. But with the greenhouse that's running year round, yeah, you absolutely have to have supplemental lighting because you will not get good yields. And as Dill was saying there that, uh, the, um, you know, we have people to work for us. Um, there's 100 and 110, 115 people that run, that work at this facility that we employ full time. So there's got to be set quotas that we reach. We know no matter what, even with supplemental lighting, our, our yields are going to be lower during the winter. Um, so that's all factored in, but they're bigger in the summer. So it's all about properly managing everything to keep it all even and even killed throughout the entire year. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. I mean, and I imagine uh, with the COVID thing and the pandemic thing, it's probably making those processes a little more complicated at times, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. You know, everybody has to, you know, our trimmers, we had to separate that all out because now everybody has a six foot rule that you have to follow. Everybody has to wear their masks no matter what they're doing. I mean, it's good to wear gloves and suits all the time anyways, especially when you're dealing with multiple acres of product. Um, IPM can do their best to keep track of where things are, but if you have people moving from zone to zone, now they're tracking whatever they had to wherever else they're going. Um, so yeah, COVID has made definitely a, made it definitely a little bit different. You know, at least we know what our temperature is on a daily basis. Um, that's kind of a bonus. Um, but yeah, with the social distancing and you know having to work around that, you know, we just you have to be creative for sure on on how to work around that. But it, it's it's still workable. Um, we're considered essential employees, which is fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's a great thing. Um, so yeah, we're still working around it and we still employ the same amount of people. We actually need to hire more people, but uh, that's an always thing. Um, so, so yeah. Excellent, excellent. All right, guys, well, um, that's basically all I've got for you. Uh, we can now just kind of open it up to BS, and I would like to... I did actually... Go ahead. We had some questions from the audience that I would love to get into real quick, too, if we could. Oh, or... good, good. Go ahead. I didn't... Okay. okay, no worries, man. I've been um, keeping track of uh, at least a few, or at least a couple here. Um, so the first one that I wanted to get through, and I thought this was a good question, um, was from Star Player TV, and they asked, can you all discuss, discuss thrips uh, or aphids, or in, in my case, I saw uh, spider mites that come in late in flower, and what you can do to the. In this case, I, uh, I'd probably be you know growing outdoor where you are, just getting whatever you know maybe from your neighbor's yard or whatever the hell's going on around you. So yeah, what what can you do to deal with some of these uh, things? We talked about caterpillars, but what about spider mites, aphids, thrips, whatever? What can you do to to handle those late in flower? About all you're going to do at that point, I think, is is bring in beneficials because you definitely don't want to spray yeah. anything. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, as far as I can tell, that's about your only – late in flower, that's about your only play. And then try to be diligent and get rid of any – you know, be diligent getting rid of leaves with, with bug damage. So fight them manually like that and then predatory – predatory mites or whatever get goes for what you know get the get the bug that specifically gets the bug you're trying to kill obviously i think that's a really good point is identification make sure you're properly identifying the pests so then you can have a better game plan 
on how to uh, deal or attack that pest. I agree. Yeah, proper identification is huge. A lot of it has to do with the season, right? All these bugs have their own seasons as well. And the different temperatures is when they're, they're at their heights. So the reason why, you, especially outdoors, the reason why you see them towards the end more so is because that's thrip season. Um, here, down here in the valley, we, in Salinas Valley, we deal with a lot of different bugs because there's a lot of agriculture around us. Strawberries, lettuces, you name it, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we, we're aware of the seasons. So when certain seasons come in, we already, IPM crew is already on top of it. They know what to identify the bug. Once it comes in, we start treating immediately on younger plants. The older plants, we try to control. Um, and that's when you come in with spot treatments. When you have a large, large grow like that, uh, are beneficials harder to, to, to implement and manage it, beneficial it, insects? Within reason. I mean, I, we still use a lot of beneficials. We do weekly releases of lots of them. The whole thing about beneficials is once again, they have seasons. So they have temperatures and humidity levels that are more ideal for them themselves. And also having um, companion plants for them that they like, you know, it's like using predatory wasps for aphid. Well, that's great and all, but they're pollen collectors as well. So you need to have flowers around that produce pollen for them to go and eat on. Um, there's lots of, lots of different bugs that are like that, the mullen bug, the mullen plants. Um, so that you can build populations. If you, if, you, if you do it properly with companion plants, you can build populations that will contain themselves. But obviously there's certain bugs that, yeah, you just beneficials that you just have to bring in on a weekly basis. Wow. Um, on for the home grower, I'm curious um, what people have found to be the right kind of bug mix, I guess, if you will, uh, for the home grower that's kind of economical. Because these things aren't cheap. You know, a lot of these most of these bugs you have to um, order like overnight shipping. So you're not only just buying, you know, $30 for the bug, but it's another, you know, 30 bucks for shipping to get to you. Um, so I found, you know, cause I've, I like um, using beneficial insects as well, but if you're releasing them on a regular basis, that's going to add up. Obviously, again, you know, you're saving money in the long run rather than going out and buy your own bud. But at the end of the day, it's still going to be what several hundred dollars that you're dealing with. So I'd be curious what people's strategies are to kind of handle that. Everything well, you, know. you you either gonna you, you can put in the money in the in, in the front end and you see it in the back end, or you can skimp on the front end and you're unhappy with your results. I mean there there's no easy way around it. This is life. It's a sacrifice. You know, at the end of the day if you're just starting out, hey, you're going to have to learn. You're going to have to right. go through these mistakes. But those mistakes are the greatest teachers. If all, I guarantee every one of these guys on this panel has made these mistakes, and that's why they've gotten to the place of the rat, because they're like, fuck, I never want to do that again. So <laughs> you don't know, about mistake. Just learn from it, get better, and then, hey, take the advice. And, and as long as you keep evolving, that's the best part about it. it as far as uh, this, my biggest strategy is I plant flowers everywhere, all kinds of different flowers, like uh, pretty flowers and then flowers like yarrow, which aren't necessarily pretty, but they attract a lot of stuff and try to get as much as anything natural you could bring in, try to get everything you possibly can. And then obviously, you know, you can, there's going to be bugs that aren't available in your area, but I mean, you'll be amazed if you, if you put, put a lot of different flowers around and stuff that attracts those beneficials in the outdoor scenario you know you'll be amazed what you can bring in you know uh, you could you could bring in help a lot of times on your own you know and that's the that's the best kind of help because that's the local knuckleheads you know they got they got home field advantage so so if you, could, the, if you could bring in if you could bring in your you know what you got in your natural area that's going to be to your benefit for sure yes uh, yeah that, and that's the camp companion plant theory is you yeah. know bring in natural pests that are already or predators that are already around you and uh, provide homes for them. Um, the more that you can have, the better off you are for sure. I think the big thing too is, is part, of, part of doing agriculture at any scale is you are going to see 
pests. That is part of that is part of doing agriculture. The trick is to not letting them establish, not letting them reproduce, not letting them infest. And that's you know that's where I you know your IPM game has to be on point. That's where your eyes have to be in the garden to identify these things. You know, inspecting your plants. You know, fighting fighting spider mice when there's a, you know a few leaves that have them is vastly different than trying to fight them if you see webby. I mean, I know for me, I, I'll never forget the first time I encountered root aphids. I mean, it was they were full infestation level, and I mean, we saw them in our house plants. We were doing an indoor at the time. We saw them everywhere, and I'll never I'll never forget those nasty nasty bugs. And you know, sometimes. Sometimes you end up doing a reset, you know, when things get, you know, if, if, if you, if you fucked up and sometimes you have to reset, you know, that's also part of, part of farming, um, you know, and you just, you just got to put the time in and learn to identify, learn to read your plants, build that relationship where you can, you can spot things happening before it becomes, you know, an infestation. If One thing we haven't really... Uh, if you, One if thing you get an infest, I'm, I'm sorry. That's uh, okay. If you get an infestation, try to do a little research and see if there's a reason why it happened too. Because a lot of times, you know, if you do a little Sherlock Holmes action, you can figure out something that 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 triggered a weakness in the plant, and then that triggered the bugs. That's all I got. <laughs> Is there more questions for us, Q? From the uh, from the channel, uh, community, I let's see. I did not find any others that I really wanted to highlight. Um, sorry if there are uh, are comments in there that I should have highlighted, um, but we definitely had a lot of um, thanks to everyone on the panel. So I definitely want to give you guys all a shout out and a thank you for everything, all the knowledge that you've been uh, dropping here and. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people, so thank you all. Uh, thank you all on the panel for doing that. Um, but yeah, JR, uh, you said you wanted to get into the, kind of the BS part. So is there anything yeah. that you wanted to b bullshit about? Well, I just kind of wanted uh, maybe uh, to talk to each person about their uh, favorite variety to grow uh, in the greenhouse or outdoors and why it's their favorite. Um, I'll go ahead and go down the list. I'll start with you, Odie. Can you... you know, it's I, I can't claim a favorite um once again i i'm all over the place so we try to find stuff that works for the facility um now if i'm but when we do pheno hunts there's definitely you know I, there's certain ones that i like to throw in um just to see how they do just because they are some of my favorites to smoke but i'm biased and those are usually our strains um but i do notice that uh you know Depending upon your seasons, right? So one thing that I noticed, I'm not a I'm not a big cookies fan. I'll throw that out there first. But in a greenhouse in a wintertime scenario, the cookies are a low light strain, so they do very well. And because they grow pretty straight up, you can pack an extra half in there. So if you have normally two thousand in this zone, you can now go to three thousand in that zone and kind of make up for the weight that you're not gonna get. Um, other than that, you know, at this point in time, it's more for beneficial of, you know, outcome. The, uh, as far as what I'm growing at home, of course, just my favorites, you know, my classic Dr. Grape High Chew, the Dr. Who Grape High Chew and some Quantum. But uh, yeah, you know, I don't necessarily have a favorite that I like to really throw anywhere. I always put Oregon Diesel outside for the summertime, just a couple of small ones, just for head stash. Just because it's so it's so fun and easy and quick to grow. Excellent. While you're at it, tell everyone about uh, your uh, company and how they can get a, how they can find you. Um, so yeah, my sons and I are homegrown natural wonders. We've been we originally started out working with uh, TGA. Um, nowadays we do our own thing, but uh, you can find our genetics in a few different places. Vagabond seeds seeds here now. Um, are the main ones, I would say, at this point in time. We've cut back on several seed companies uh, just for basic reasons. Excellent. 
Odie, all right Je i was just go gonna ahead. say Odie, I, I was watching your stream the other day or you were on a stream the other day and you dropped the bomb that um the seeds that are out there they're the last of uh what you grew so i i literally went out and bought a, another pack of doctor who that i just got in the mail the other day um from mm -hmm. seeds here now because i was mm -hmm. like i was literally talking to my wife um that same day saying like man i really missed that doctor who that i grew last year i just loved the terps on it so yeah man you were just saying on uh, a stream the other day that what's out there is out there is that is that true it is true we uh, we had an unfortunate circumstances last winter and we lost our mails um, I know that a lot of companies out there would just go looking for mails that look similar, but that's not us. I can't do it. We can't just do that. Um, so those lines will be retired. So once they're gone, they're gone. Um, we have new lines that we're working on. I just spent, or I just spent the last six months going through a couple hundred uh, quantum seeds, looking for a good mail, a couple of them, and uh, found those. Getting ready to start doing some work with those. We did uh, a couple of small batch breeds that crosses with the Dr. Who mail to 17 different things. So I've been going through those since we popped a bunch of those at Harborside, picked a lot of stuff out of there. Um, so there's new stuff coming, but yes, those lines are, are retired at this point. So if they're there and you can get them, I get them, but they won't be around for long. Wow, that's crazy. I didn't know that. That's nuts. Yeah. Wow, sorry to hear that, brother. Yeah, it happens, you know, I mean, We've been making those same crosses for eight years, you know, so keeping the same males and same females around, around for that long gets a little rough. Males are a little uh, touchy and get finicky and can have attitudes at times more so than the females, so it seems. Um, still have all the moms. So as far as those go, you know, Sweet Irish Kush is still there. Mad Science is still there. Oregon Diesel, um, Orange Cream Soda. All the moms are still around. Um, just lost the dads. Wow. Wow. All right, Jeff, uh, can you go ahead and tell us about your favorite outdoor and let the people know who you are and where you're from and where they can find you? Yeah, definitely. Um, so you can find uh, our work directly through me is dragonslamgenetics.com. And then we're with uh, Neptune Seed Bank and Nucleus Seed Bank and Canada Seeds for Canada Guys um and then well-grown seeds as well um and so for favorite that that changes a lot for me i say right now what's um i'm pretty psyched on is we just this last run here in hawaii went a little rough we are off grid and we lost uh two of our generators that one of them that runs our flower greenhouse um so this run we've had no dehumidifier so they've this last run we got to see exactly what level of resistance everything has to 99 percent humidity on a daily basis and um there's two of our i call it the mac dragon which is the caps cut of mac to my dragon stash f2 flagship line and there's two of them that this this last run they've captured my attention we're going to be doing quite a bit of work um with that line um, and then also, I'm pretty psyched right now. We found the old uh, skunk dog cut that is uh, here here in Hawaii that um, you know pretty much can take any level of moisture without without mold or mildew. It's a uh, you know bulletproof Hawaii old old line that we are uh, really excited to start working with uh, in projects. So that's you know those are our two next uh, big focuses. Um, you know, we've got a lot of a lot of balls in the air here in Hawaii. We've got our property, and then we're getting a second property set up right now. Um, one property is going to be strictly for for breeding purposes, and then the other property we're going to be doing all of our big pheno hunting and all of our you know all of our selection sensimilia will be done at the second property. So we're going to be uh, we're going to be hitting it pretty hard here over the next uh, next few years. Excellent. That's great, man. And, and, and man, I was so stoked to see you just do it. I mean, you went for it, you packed up everything, you moved to Hawaii, which I went to Hawaii uh, for my first time last year. I'd never been anywhere tropical in my life. And being from the rainforests of Oregon on the coast, uh, I felt like I lived in the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. 
and I've traveled all over the country and I really never felt like I found a place that I thought was as beautiful as where I was from until I went to Maui. Uh, we did the road to Hana and um, man, I'm telling you, it was just gorgeous. It was just beautiful everywhere. Uh, and um, So yeah, I really am stoked for you to be able to make that move out to Hawaii. I think that's really awesome, man. Yeah, it's been a trip. Um, you know, we had never even visited the island uh, before we moved. Um, we just, you know, we had had a lot of struggles in Oregon. And, um, you know, we, we were stuck in the renting um, and trying to rent and do, you know, commercial size cannabis grows. It does not go hand in hand. And, uh, you know, we took a chance and it's really felt like Hawaii has really embraced us. Uh, we, we got set up much faster than I could have ever even believed was going to be possible. Um, you know, and we have really have met the right that have, you know, come into our life at the right time to, uh, to really do what, you know, what I've always wanted to be able to do. And it's been, you know, it's crazy. We got here and then COVID happened, but you know, it is what it is. We're, we're rolling with the punches and, uh, loving the tropical life. Nice. Beautiful. Yeah, so uh, now I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Moby Dill. What's your favorite uh, greenhouse outdoor to grow, and uh, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, I'd say it changes just like the rest of the guys. You know, we're fortunate enough to have so many different strains, uh, so many elite different cuts, or, you know, I'm able to pop seeds. So it's constantly changing because we're getting new flavors. But uh, some classics, you know, the Cushman's is a, is a, a classic. I'm favorite, you know, it's a good mix of Bubba and Animal Mints. Uh, another big one that's uh, with the Animal Mints is the Skittle Mints right now. But I'm really hyped on and it's got a good citrus to it with uh, some like Catholic Church incense kind of back end. And it's one that just kind of lingers in the room for a few hours after you smoke it. So it's pretty nice. So I'd say those two at the moment. Um, but yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Moby Dill 420 buzz uh, same thing Moby Dill but uh you can find all our products you know we're in Michigan so if you're ever out here we have a, a adult use and medical uh you can find all of our products uh through weed man um you know we have everything listed dispensaries and everything like that we're highlight farms on Instagram we have a solventless line cheap salt um and we're out of the pre-roll line Annie Tokley so you know, right now we got a 17,000 square foot greenhouse and 25,000 square foot of indoor. And in about the next two weeks, I'll be bringing on another 10,000 square foot of greenhouse. So we're constantly and then and, and just kind of pushing it, you know, to keep up with uh, everything going on in Michigan, because uh, there are a lot of people growing uh, quite rapidly. So it's an honor to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, an honor to be a part of this panel with guys like Jeff, Odie Diesel, you know, Odie's a guy I've looked up to for a long time. So. You know, I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you very much. You're welcome, brother. I was glad to see you hop on Cannabis, man. Uh, hey. it, always it always stokes me when my bros come on Cannabis. You know, it shows a little love. You know, I appreciate it. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, I love people seeing to try to do some different shit and, so, and push themselves. And, you know, so uh, from one guy trying to do it to another, you know, it's cool to see. So respect. Respect. Maximum. All right, next we got Indica B. Tell us about uh, where people can find you and all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, and your man. favorite, your favorite outdoor. My favorite outdoor. Uh, so right now, man, uh, my it was a blueberry Kush I did in 2018. That was my favorite outdoor for out here. That stuff was phenomenal. And uh, I'm still getting asked about it from people, man. So I'd like to get that again probably next year. And uh, right now, man, is uh, the Lemon Jeffrey by uh, Ivy Genetics, man. It's just, uh, I took a clone, man, from indoors and it's, dude, it looks beautiful outdoors. Uh, so I, I think out here, I'm going to try again from uh, seed next year with some, some, uh, some Lemon Jeffrey and, and maybe one other ones of uh, Irie. So uh, I'm going to try that. Um, but uh, and yeah, you can find me right here on Cannabis right now, man. Like I said, uh, I, uh, I'm a very, very quiet person, man, and I'm so glad that uh, I'm blessed to be here and asked to be here, man, and share some knowledge, even though I'm, I have nowhere near what you guys have. I look up to you guys, man, you know, so you guys taught me a lot, and uh, I, I just love learning, and, and 
Um, I'm hoping to uh, someday go 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 big enough out here, man. In this in this industry, I want to make this my life and my my career. And uh, I just have such huge uh, passion for medical, man. Medical cannabis. You know, I suffer from a lot of health problems, and it's, it's saved my life in many many ways. So. Um, you know, and I just, yeah, man, that's where you guys can find me. I'm going to probably come out with an Instagram eventually here soon. So, uh, I just been super busy with construction downstairs. You guys will be seeing that on can buzz here soon. We got, uh, some orange gasm. I got, I got a couple packs of that. We're going to run that down there. Um, so we're going to, that's going to be the first one to go down there when I light up here, hopefully in another month or so. So, uh, and I'll be harvesting tomorrow and I'll, I'll get some good video and shots and, uh, Post that on Cannabis too, man. So I just want to thank you guys. And uh, it's a huge blessing, man. Very big blessing to be here with some big people, some talented, talented people, man. I really look up to you guys. And it's huge, man. Thank you guys, man. I appreciate it. You're Much very welcome, my friend. You're very welcome. <laughs> Excellent. So now we've got a favorite enemy, uh, Northern Lights. Uh, let, let the people know what your favorite outdoor is or greenhouse and uh, let people know where they can find you. Well, you can find me on Cannabuzz, obviously. And uh, I'm on Instagram too, at Northern Lights and D&D. Uh, I kind of really like the Cannabuzz a lot more than I like Instagram more and more every, every day though. So uh, like hanging out here more. The, the people are cooler and uh, better conversations. It's more, more similar to the old forum days kind of like the best you know your best memories of the, my best memories of the forum days it seems seems similar to that so i'm real i'm real stoked on the can of buzz uh, and i'm honored to be here uh also uh really really cool for the opportunity so thank you i appreciate it hope i hope i was able to to get some good info out there uh i i always got to have either a kush or a cam for i've been doing a lot of northern lights the last few years but the trend is always had you got to have either a kush or a cam you got to have that end of the day you know, powerhouse, you know, I got, I always, I, there's something about it, you know? So throughout the years, I've always had either, either Kush or Cam of some sort going. So, and they, and they grow, they grow good outdoors too. You can actually, you know, if you, with some training, you can actually get a good yield out of the OGs outdoors. So. Old nice. standards. Excellent. Hugh, do you got anything to say, my friend? Yeah, man, I guess thank you all for, um, I really appreciate everyone's perspectives. Moby Dill, I appreciate you saying, man, you got to fucking roll with it. If you got to buy a bunch of bugs, you got to buy a bunch of bugs. I appreciate that, man. Um, you know, it's, I've, I'm a new grower myself and, you know, we created cannabis because, you know, part of my drive was I was trying to learn from all these people on these panels. You know, I I was following Moby Dill. I was following Odie and all these, you know, everyone here. And um, I'm just so glad that we're able to provide this platform in this community. All the, A lot of the people that are watching right now are the, the core of Cannabis and the community. I, for that matter, a lot of you on this panel are as well. And um, a lot of people thank us for the community that we've created here on Cannabis. And as much as that's, you know, myself and JR, you know, trying to set that up in the first place, it's, a, it's all you as well, you know, in our community that provide that vibe and provide a place that is welcoming to everyone. And so I just wanted to say I appreciate that and give everyone a shout out there. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. Um, for having me on and for for our panel for joining us it's been great to um, have all this knowledge shared with our, our community there's we've just received so many positive comments from people thanking us for uh, putting this putting this out there so yeah I'll hand it over to you JR thanks man all right everyone I want to thank you all very much for coming and hanging out with us and sharing your knowledge uh, the more we can lift people up with knowledge uh, the better we're all going to be. When I go to my homie's house, I want to smoke just as good as weed as he's coming to my house. So share the love and share the knowledge, everyone. Growers love. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Peace and love. Peace and love. Absolutely. Peace and love, man. I can't agree with you guys more, man. I wish there was more of it around here in this world today, man. But We need it. <laughs> America needs it. <laughs> I wish people would smoke more, grow more, and just, you know, create more peace, love, and happiness, man. You know? That's right. We need more of it, man. But, you know, I, I like for me, I thank you guys too for creating this because it's, it's just to bring all of us people together. 
we can create that and, and, and try to try to pull more of that into to having a community like this where they feel comfortable, they feel safe. Um, they're going to get the correct and right answers or put in the right directions, you know, and uh, it's it's awesome, man. Like I just uh, not to get off track or keep anything going, but uh, I just had a guy automation freedom. I'm going to shout him out. He's on Cannabis. I just met him the first time. He's on my house. He was at my house for dinner today, man. That's who was here. So, um, you know, it's just like I said, you know, I wouldn't I never expected to meet someone on Cannabis and come to my house with his wife and have dinner with my wife. You know, it's crazy, man. It's That's just so cool. It's just awesome. Man. You know what I mean? That did. I mean, crazy things can happen, man. And, and, and I just I thank you guys and I'm sure everybody else does. But you know, um, I just, exactly, man. I just want to just keep on spreading this, man. This is awesome, you know? So, yeah, man. Well, I guess we'll, we'll leave it there, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate everyone's time today. Um, you can always keep on checking out Cannabis. We get updates um, pretty regularly. We've gotten a lot of updates lately on our website. The website works uh, great these days. It's very similar to the app. So if you ever have issues with the app, Go load up the website. It's just cannabuzz.app, and you're good to go. Thanks so much, everyone. I hope you have a great Saturday. Have a great Halloween. And last but not least, make sure to vote on November 3rd. I don't care who you're voting for. Vote, um, and make sure to get out there. I appreciate everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your weekend. Peace, everyone. Yeah, have a good weekend, guys. Have a good Thank weekend, you. guys, man. Peace out, man. Much